Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you all here, those of you who could make it today. Uh, and um, we're always delighted to see new faces, some who are come back, coming back for the first time since our shutdown, some here for the first time ever. Uh, we just want to welcome you all here today. Now, today I decided to preach on something that, you know, I've never actually preached about before, but thinking of it, I think, why didn't, haven't I preached on it earlier? Uh, and I've entitled it, The Disciples' Prayer. Just make sure that this is working. Yes, okay. A young boy was saying his evening prayers one night, and he was using his indoor voice. When suddenly, towards the end of his prayer, he started using his outdoor voice, <laughs> and he says, and please give me a scooter. And when his mother asked him why he yelled out that part, he says, well, because grandma's a little bit deaf, and I wanted to hear it in the other room because it's my birthday coming up. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, as we grow older, some of us never get out of that grow uh, get, getting stuff phase you know we, we don't quite grow out of that it just kind of moves up a notch to a different level and you know like that song goes oh lord won't you buy me a mercedes benz you probably all remember that song old old song of course i'm exaggerating however some christians really have challenges when it comes to praying is that true uh, and some even struggle to pray much at all have you ever experienced that problem? Perhaps during 2020, your praying has moved up to another level where it has not been before. Um, perhaps you have great faith, you know, like the centurion, for instance, uh, who said to Jesus, you know, there's no need for you to come. You just say the word and I believe it'll happen. But perhaps you're like Zacchaeus, where you may be caught up with all, you know, different business deals and the cares of this life, so much to the point that you've actually crowded Jesus out from your life. It is said that a vibrant prayer life is one of the most challenging aspects of a Christian's life. Have you ever thought about that? A vibrant prayer life is one of the most challenging aspects of a Christian's life. God has granted to each one of us the faith of a mustard seed. But I believe that God has put in our hearts a desire for much more than just the mustard seed. Don't you think? And so unfortunately, we often put our energies into the wrong moors. And so we crowd out our free connection that we ought to have with the Lord. So, coming back to the question, have you ever struggled with prayer? Most people, if they're honest, will say, yes, at some stage I have struggled or, you know, I've been discouraged in my life with something and, and it's caused me to pray less or, or stop praying at a, at a certain point in time. But if you were to ask Jesus to teach you something, you know, our Sabbath school lessons here have been about learning. If you were to ask Jesus to teach you something, what would it be? The disciples asked Jesus in regards to prayer. They said in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us how to pray. We don't read in the scriptures that they said, Lord, teach us to witness effectively. Or maybe, Lord, teach us to do miracles. Or, you know, Lord, teach us uh, about the scriptures. I mean, he was already doing that, wasn't he? Uh, he? They didn't say, Lord, teach us to live an abundant life. Teach us to forgive others. Or teach us to be a great teacher like you. You know, they were already following Jesus. So they were getting all of that as he was mentoring them and, and all that as they were going along. They had that great master there with them. But we do read that they specifically asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And most likely if we learn to pray, the other things will actually follow, won't they? So have you ever asked Jesus to help you with prayer? The disciples did. Why not? Probably a good thing to request of the Lord, isn't it? If you were to ask the Lord to teach you about prayer, what do you think he may do? Well, we know what he did for the disciples. 
He gave them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Although perhaps it could be referred to as the disciples' prayer. (laughs) Because it was shared with them, it was given to them so that they could pray it and that they may learn from it. True, we refer to it as the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer. So, um, before he shares with them the prayer, he first of all, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, he tells them, you know, don't be like the hypocrites. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, we read, uh, it's like a prelude, if you like, to the Lord's Prayer. He says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites or the pretenders. For when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. The word hypocrite, according to the Greek language, upokritis, was used to describe an actor or, you know, uh, like a stage player. And... uh, Jesus is saying here, don't be like that. You know, prayer is not a performance. We don't need to impress God or others. Rather, our prayer should come from the heart. I like to have Jeff was up here praying before for his friends who who are unwell. Prayer needs to come from the heart, doesn't it? I remember studying the Bible with um, Esther back in 2005. Today, she's my mother-in-law. (laughs) back then when I was studying with her I didn't even know her daughter today she's my wife Uh, that's a long story short there right but uh, (laughs) um, you know she had been away from God for some 35 years grew up in the church her 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 father was a minister he was uh, conference president Uh, And yet, when she was some 16 years old and came out to Australia, she left and was away for a long, long time. But she was on her way back. And she, I remember, you know, as we got to the point in the Bible studies, well, I would encourage her to pray. And she would pray these really simple prayers. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, she prays like a little child, you know, I wasn't trying to be judgmental or anything, but I I honestly thought, you know, it's so simplistic. It's like a little child. And yet, God was answering her prayers in amazing ways. Amazing ways. There was amazing things that were happening in her life and continue to happen in her life. So, teach us how to pray. We often have examples of prayer where as we grow up in the home, in the church, that's where we learn, right? Uh, We may learn uh, from our role models, whether they be at home or at the church, as we grow in our faith. And I guess that's why some people, um, I guess they've grown up that way. They'll still, when they pray, they may use the words thee, thou, and thy, right? Their, their, Their prayers are like the King James Bible sort of thing, right? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe that's how mum and dad prayed, you know, and that's been their experience, and that's how they pray. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, It's our environment or our life situations that we're in that will often lead to the types of prayer that we pray. Isn't that true? And that's why I was saying maybe in this year 2020, our prayers may have gone to a different level because we're in a different environment. We're surrounded by things that we've never seen before. And so we come back to this question, the disciples' question to Jesus, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. They must have witnessed something in the life of Jesus, something different about the way he prayed, and they wanted to be part of that. And so um, as we consider uh, Matthew chapter 6, if you want to follow along, The Lord's Prayer is found here in Matthew chapter 6. It's also in in Luke chapter 11. But I'll be going through here, Matthew chapter 6. And really, you know, as I was going through this, you could really, (laughs) you could do a sermon on every verse. (laughs) I've I've, I've pulled it all into into one sermon, but really you could preach on every single verse here. 
Uh, the first part there, uh, Matthew 6, verse 9, the second part of the verse there says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The word that Jesus uses to call upon God is Abba, meaning dearest Father. What do you sense here? It's a sense of intimacy, right? Only Jesus had the inherent right to refer to God as his Father because he came from the Father. He was the only begotten of the Father. But what Jesus was telling his disciples and telling us today is we can have that same privilege too. And that's not something to be taken lightly. Because of the perfect, sinless obedience of Jesus, we can today be grafted in to the family of God through Christ. Isn't that true? And so Jesus is encouraging his followers into that same familial intimacy with God. So every time we open our mouths and say, Our Father, we're actually acknowledging the great redemptive work that Jesus has done on our behalf when we say, Our Father. Notice that Jesus doesn't say here, My Father. He says, Our Father. Some people may have a hard time addressing God as Father, and that's understandable because some fathers are cruel. Some fathers are abusive. Some fathers are negligent. In that sense, God is not my father or your father. He is our father. Do you get that? He's our father. He is the one who has loved us with an everlasting love. He is the one that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John writes, for the father himself loves you in John 16 verse 27. What a privilege. What an honor. Hallowed be your name. When we express this thought, we're saying that God is pure, God is holy, God is sacred, he is set apart uh, from anything else that we may encounter in our lives. And so it's no coincidence that we find in the Ten Commandments, that the third commandment that says what? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Our attitude to what God and, and our regard for who he is makes a big difference. And so if we're serious about God having an impact on our lives, an impact in our lives and on the world around us, it's, it's of vital importance that we acknowledge his rightful place. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so it's no accident that Jesus has this right here at the very beginning of this prayer. Because if there's no worship, there's no adoration, and if there's no adoration, there's no true obedience to follow. In verse 10, Jesus teaches us to submit to God's will. Um, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is teaching us that our desires and our will ought to be aligned with his will. What do you expect to take place, my friends, when you pray? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we have great expectations when we pray? Do we truly believe that God will intervene? That he will help? Sometimes I think we, we are prone to some doubt, aren't we? Isn't that true? The good news is that we're shown that even the early Christian church, the disciples themselves, could be frail and weak in this area like us. You may recall the story of uh, Peter being in prison, Acts chapter 12. He's in prison and, and the, the disciples, the, the early Christian believers, what are they doing? They're praying, right, for Peter who's in prison. And, uh, and so while they're at this prayer meeting, the angel comes and he lets him out of the prison and, uh, you know, takes him out safely and, and Peter knows where they're going to be. So he goes straight to the house. He knocks on the door and what happens? They don't believe it's him. <laughs> what is this? Is this a ghost? I mean, here they are. They're praying for him. He's at the door. They don't let him in. 
<laughs> and so he keeps knocking. He keeps knocking until finally they let him in, and of course they're shocked. Does this sound like our prayers? Are we shocked when God answers our prayers? <laughs> Sometimes we pray, but our expectations are not where they ought to be. Isn't that true? Sometimes we pray and it doesn't turn out the way that we had hoped. And that too we must accept. I mean, after all, we are still living in a sin-filled world and we're not immune to what goes on around us as, as believers. Jesus himself went through great pain, didn't he? And he said... Not my will, but yours. And so he went on to endure great suffering and even death because there there simply was no other way. That was God's will. So when we call upon our Father in heaven and exalt his hallowed name, we're actually calling, you know, the, the kingdom of God, which, you know, an invisible thing, which becomes visible through us because of the power and grace that God makes available to us. It becomes visible through us as believers when we submit to his will. So point number three is uh, our dependence is on God. You know, the physical issues. We are dependent on God. Verse 11 in chapter 6 says, Give us this day our daily bread. Some people see this as spiritual food you know the bread of life and that's true but God is interested in our physical needs too isn't that true and uh, as our scripture reading was uh, Pinky came out and she shared from Matthew 6 33 onwards she she read but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you God gives us what we need for each day as we put him first It may not always be as miraculous, you know, we've probably all heard or read those stories where, you know, somebody was destitute, they didn't have money, and suddenly a check arrives in the mail. I don't know, have you ever had a check like that arrive in the mail just as you need it? Maybe you have. Uh, It seems to have happened for quite a few people. But, you know, God doesn't always work that way. Perhaps he organises a second job for us, or a job or a sec- second or third job even these days. You know, people have all these, these part-time jobs these days in our world. So God helps us to meet our needs in different ways. And the other thing um, is that quite often God doesn't always act straight away. Have you found that? Sometimes he waits until like the 11th hour, you know, the minute, a minute before midnight, so to speak, before he acts and... That way we acknowledge him because we understand that it's not what? It's not just fate. It's not just good fortune. It's not just luck that something has happened. But no, God has come through. He comes through right on time. So we just need to trust him. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Now, this uh, next story, I was given approval to share this. Um, just this week, uh, Jenny and George, the uh, couple that are uh, at, at my other church. So I asked them if I could share this story here with you. Uh, recently, they bought a large house on a property in the country with acreage, five acres, beautiful place. Um, and uh, the idea was that it could be a retreat, you know, if they needed to go out to the country, they had a place to go, etc. But now they have a mortgage. <laughs> uh, they, they have rent that they're still paying here in, in the city, in Parramatta, and with various bills that they had to do for improvements to the house, etc., maintenance, you know, this broke and that broke, and they had to install this and that, etc. They were seriously questioning their decision. Should they sell the country property? Should they just move to the country? It was causing a lot of friction in their home. George believed that God had put them in Parramatta to help grow the church plant there. He firmly believed that. He said, I'm not moving out there. He didn't want to move. After all, it was an answer to prayer that our church plant had been praying for. Hey, God, you know... Give us some Adventists that actually live in Parramatta, in the CBD. And then suddenly we find two that are living there 
and then they get married. You know what I mean? How amazing is that? So, you know, he feels like God has put us here for a purpose, to help grow the church. Jenny believed that God wanted them to move to the country, especially as we're in a pandemic. You know, everyone's moving to the country. <laughs> um, they were living in an apartment with a small backyard. They had six dogs. <laughs> you laugh now. Uh, six months ago, they had no dogs, but they got this idea, you know. Uh, they were going to breed and these dogs and make a bunch of money. These dogs sell for thousands of dollars. So, you know, it's a good idea. But everything was kind of working up to a breaking point, if you like. And on top of it all, the landlord asked them to vacate in the next few weeks because the landlord wanted to move in. Where are they going to go? What should they do? Could they uh, get an affordable place? Uh, how could they get an affordable place that was also close to his workplace? Uh, could they keep their beloved dogs? Um, you know, they've grown attached to them, as you do. Uh, how could they remain in Parramatta? Should they remain in Parramatta at all? Could they keep the country property, even for the benefit of the boys growing up, etc.? You know, George said, sell. Jenny cried. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, you know, it was all happening this week. Uh, they both wanted to be faithful to God's leading. And then on Tuesday... This week, a breakthrough came. They found a cheaper rental property, a house, not an apartment. And guess where it is? In Parramatta. It's got space for dogs. And when, uh, when Jenny was inspecting the property, the, the landlord actually happened to show up. So there was the real estate, the landlord, they were all there. And the landlord loved the dogs. He loved the idea that his backyard was going to be put to good use, you know? So on top of that, the country property was put on Airbnb and within a short amount of time, there was over $15,000 worth of bookings. Everyone's happy. But they were pushed to the brink, to the 11th hour. Do you understand? A minute before midnight, what do we do? Stress. Even I, who met with them on Monday night, I, of little faith, said, well, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Perhaps you should move to the country. Perhaps you could get a cheaper rental place, you know, somewhere west of Liverpool. There's all that land out there. You know, only half an hour from work rather than two hours if you move out to the country, probably driving in every day, two hours, two and a half hours, whatever it is. So you see, God cares for our physical needs. He even gives us much more than what we need most of the time, doesn't he? God also wants to help us with our emotional needs, you know, dealing with people. Verse 12 says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Many of you will remember the Rwandan genocide in 1994, where in the space of just 100 days, uh, the members of the Hutu, I think it was, the Hutu majority, uh, slaughtered about 800,000 uh, people, mostly of the Tutsi minority. You remember that, right? One of the killers that was imprisoned later on was recognised by a Seventh-day Adventist widow as the killer of her own son. You may have read about this. I think it was in the Record or Adventist Review at one stage. And she visited him in prison and she forgave him. And later on, she took this man under her wing as if he was her own son because she had lost her son. He had killed him. She says, you, you know, I've lost my son. Will you be my son? How amazing is that? There are some incredible stories of forgiveness, aren't there? Last year, when we ran the series here at church, Forgive to Live, we learned that when we forgive, we actually free ourselves from ongoing pain. Isn't that true? It's a divine thing that we are called to do. And if it is possible for God to forgive us, then surely we ought to forgive others too. I mean, after all, what price did God pay to forgive? He gave it all, didn't he? 
a price that cannot be measured. So what about us? What price do we pay when we forgive others? It's pretty minimal, really, isn't it? Minimal. In effect, we're actually releasing somebody that's living rent-free in our head. Isn't that true? Somebody is in our head. They're taking up space in our head. Rent-free. We're just releasing them when we forgive. So God wants to help us with our emotional needs. Jesus went on to say in verses 14 and 15, he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. The next verse, the beginning part of verse 13, says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You've probably heard the well-known saying, what would Jesus do? Uh, some young people wear the little bracelets, don't they? It's a WWJD, what would Jesus do? Do you ever ask yourself as you're tempted, or maybe even if you've fallen, what would Jesus do? Or what would Jesus have done? The Bible says in James 1.13 that God does not tempt anyone. It makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus came to set the captives free, not to lead the captives into, in, into sin. So when we say this prayer, do not lead us into temptation, we have to take some responsibility for ourselves. You know, clearly if we have a gambling problem, then we don't go down to the local RSL because there's cheap food, you know, because you, ha you know you have to walk past the pokies. Isn't that true? You have to realise that, you know, if I've got a problem, I don't go there. Uh, if you struggle with drugs, you don't go to that party because you know that they'll be there. If you struggle with alcohol, you know, you don't go and hang out with, at the bar with your, with your mates because you know that there are probably safer and better places to catch up with them. Jesus wants us to realise that we are in a spiritual battle. It's real. We live in a world that there's temptation all around us. And so when we pray for deliverance, we recognise that it's God who is our strength. He helps us to make wise choices well before we even fall. Okay? Martin Luther put it this way. You, can keep the bird, you cannot keep the birds from flying over your head. And I guess occasionally they drop some blessings on your head too, right? But, he said, you can stop them from making a nest on your head. True? You cannot stop the birds from circling above your head, but you can stop them from building a nest on your head. So, our total reliance really needs to be on God. Total reliance needs to be on the Lord of our life. So, um, as we put God as the Lord of our life, he reigns as Lord over our lives. The second part of verse 13 says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, I understand that the earliest manuscripts that have been found of Matthew actually omit this second part of verse 13. Sometimes, like in an NIV Bible or something like it'll be in a footnote or something like that. Uh, if we remove it, it's as if the model prayer that Jesus has given is kind of left open-ended by Jesus. And who knows? Perhaps the earliest Christians, as they resonated with this prayer, responded to this prayer and perhaps, you know, added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As a worshipful response to an awesome God, we put him on the throne, not ourselves. We allow him to reign supreme in our lives rather than some other inferior distraction that takes us off course. My friends, the Lord wants to help you. The Lord wants to hear from you. And if there's ever a time to seek the Lord, it's today. If for whatever reason you're praying less than what you used to, if you're discouraged with your prayer life, if you're struggling, start. Start praying. In Luke chapter 11, we read there, Luke chapter 11, 
verses 9 to 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Sounds bizarre, doesn't it? What sort of a father would do that? But there are some fathers that do crazy stuff. If then, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? You know, in our home, we have various drawings um, that my five-year-old Alana puts up on our fridge. This was in colour, but I made it black and white. <laughs> uh, today, her drawings are much better than what they were a year ago. I mean, she can even write now. She puts God on there, you know. Put, writes a love heart and writes God. I love God. <laughs> um, and I can only assume that she's drawn herself and mum in that picture. But... Um, you know, her drawings are a lot better now than what they were a year ago and much, much, much better than what they were two years ago. But we love her drawings irrespective of what they look like because we love her. True? In the same way, God loves every prayer that you send up. It doesn't matter how it sounds. It doesn't matter if it seems awkward. It doesn't matter if you haven't prayed for a long, long time. God loves it because he loves you. So today, the Lord wants to teach us how to pray, just as he taught the disciples how to pray. So why don't we make the Lord's Prayer our prayer? It is, after all, the disciples' prayer. We have so much depth that we can learn from this prayer. Today, really, we haven't scratched the surface. Um, an unknown author penned this. I cannot say our if I live only for myself. Our Father, right? I cannot say our if I live only for myself. I cannot say Father if I do not endeavour each to be his child. I cannot say hallowed be your name if I am playing around with sin. I cannot say your kingdom come if I'm not allowing God to reign in my life. I cannot say your will be done if all I want is my way all the time. I cannot say give us this daily bread if I am trusting in myself instead of God's provision. I cannot say forgive us our debts if I am nursing a grudge or withholding forgiveness for someone else. <clears throat> I cannot say, lead us not into temptation, if I deliberately place myself in its path. What is your prayer experience? Would you be willing to make the Lord's Prayer your prayer? A couple of years ago, I wanted to encourage my daughter to sing and uh, to use her voice in different ways, you know, loud, soft, airy, or a chesty kind of voice, to sing with feeling, you know. And I also encouraged her to make up her own songs as we drove along in the car. And she still does it to this day. She was just, last night she sang me a song that she just made up on the spot. <laughs> it went for about two minutes. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, many times, you know, as we were driving, you know, she might have been upset or something. She might be crying for whatever reason. And as we did that, her th thoughts would be taken away from something negative to a fun time while we were driving. She would say, OK, Dad, now it's your turn. <laughs> so I'd have to sing something, and then she'd sing something again. But one of the things that I did while I was driving is I sang the Lord's Prayer to her. Perhaps we could use it more often, even if it's a song. Song in our heart, song in our thoughts, as we turn our thoughts towards God in adoration. 
So, you know, Pinky has been trying to get me to sing here for a while, <laughs> and I've resisted. And so today, as I was preparing for this, I thought, yeah, why don't I sing Our Father? Um, with no music. <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe too brave. But I think the closest person to me is five or more metres away, so we should be okay. Is that all right? <clears throat> Sorry? <laughs> you can go further back if, uh, if I'm out of tune or something, but actually my mouth is a bit dry, so... Oh, I've got some water here. kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For Oh! 